Good evening there, everybody. What is happening? Hopefully, you all are having a wonderful day today. So when it comes down to it, I thought, of course, that I would give my little fight preview and my fight breakdowns and my fight predictions of the up-and-coming fights, at least between that of the main event and the co-main event of this headliner uh, and co-main headliner, uh, main headliner, excuse me, of the up-and-coming PBC card, I believe, on Amazon Prime. The first one, of course, being between that of Tim Zhu uh, versus Sebastian Fondora, and of course that of Rolly Romero versus Isaac Pitbull Cruz. And first, I'm going to give my prediction on the main event, which is that of Zhu versus that of Fondora, and then you know, lastly, I'm going to do that of Rolando Romero versus that of Isaac Pitbull Cruz, because of course I want to start off with the main event. <laughs> but you know, we'll uh, we'll see where it goes. But anyways. You know, this is going to be a very interesting card. I don't think that, in my view, that it's an elite, elite card, but it's a good little card, uh, you know, kind of to start off, you know, at least with probably the first decent boxing pay-per-view of the year. Uh, of course, for those of you that did not know, it was originally supposed to be Tim Zhu versus Keith one-time Thurman, uh, but of course, Keith one-time fighting every five years Thurman <laughs> lived up to his name, and of course, he ended up getting a bicep injury, unfortunately. Um, you know, and of course, some people, they grilled Keith Thurman stating that, you know, he was allegedly ducking that at Tim Zhu. I'm not going to go as far to state that maybe he was avoiding Tim Zhu. Uh, I mean, maybe, I don't know, but Keith Thurman, uh, you know, he did seem, uh, pretty set on this fight of potentially getting a shot also at Terrence Bud Crawford. And that's also another reason why this fight's going to be very particularly interesting because whoever is the winner of this fight apparently is going to get that at Terrence Bud Crawford which I think is the best move for both available parties. I've been saying for the longest time that, in my view, Crawford should right now be focusing on the 154-pound weight class, especially a fight with Tim Zhu, and then against Jamel Charlo, if he's able to get that fight against Jamel Charlo, because that's really the fight that everybody wants to see. And Crawford claims right now that he wants to go up to 168 and fight Canelo, and I believe him to somewhat of a degree, but, uh, you know, Terrence Bud Crawford, in my view, he has other fish to fry. And then later on, if he can, you know, unify 154 or beat at least the two guys that he needs to there, then we can talk about a Canelo Alvarez fight, potentially. You know, assuming that Canelo Alvarez beats Jaime Munguia and whatever other opponents are in front of him. But we'll see what happens. But anyways, just to get straight into it, this is going to be a very interesting fight. And some may ask the question, do you believe that this is a better fight uh, overall than what it once was originally? between that of Zoo and Fondora compared to that of Zoo and Keith Thurman. And in my personal view, yeah, I do. The reason why I state that is because there's going to be certain things that in my view that Sebastian Fondora might be able to bring to the table that are really going to answer certain questions about that of Tim Zhu. Because Zoo, of course, you know, who is the son of Kostya Zhu, who of course was the great Australian champion, I believe, Australian slash Russian champion, uh, throughout that of the 90s, who became completely undisputed, I believe, within that of the 140-pound weight class, uh, I think, during the 90s. Uh, you know, uh, and they, they fight, in my view, particularly similar, which is that, you know, they're a little bit of tactical, I'm not going to say brawlers, but they like to break you down incrementally. And Tim Zhu, in my view, you know, he definitely uh, has done a lot better overall as a son of a former great champion. Uh, than what a lot of other ones have, including Chavez Jr. and some of the other ones, even though, of course, Chavez Jr. was once upon a time a champion. But Costia Zhu, in my view, you can definitely tell that he takes a lot of influence from his father's style, which is that, you know, plodding forward style and, you know, kind of coming forward in somewhat of a technical way, and they're going to incrementally, you know, try to take you out. Uh, Costia Zhu pretty much was the same. And Costia Zhu, you know, he was a guy that, you know, he could box a little bit, especially if he felt that he could outdo you in that way. But Costia Zhu, and I see the same thing in Tim Zhu, those guys are pretty much fighters that <laughs> what they're mainly looking to try to do, especially if you provide a problem in terms of the movement category, they're going to try to really break you down incrementally. They're going to try to come forward and kind of, you know, move in and out a little bit overall to separate some space. You know, they're not super duper great in terms of their feet, in my personal view, at least in terms of using them to get in and outside of the zone. But Tim Zhu... Just a lot like his father, he kind of uses almost that leaning back style a little bit that you can tell that it creates a little bit of a problem or a challenge in terms of hitting him. So Tim Zhu is a guy that, you know, just like his father, Kostya Zhu, he kind of likes, you know, to be, you know, toward the end at the end of the range and wait for you to overextend or wait overall. So, you know, he might be able to shoulder roll or, you know, he might be able to get you to miss a certain punch so he can get on the inside range and get you overall with a good shot, whether it be to the body or whether it be a right to the face or, 
you know, whether it be overall a jab straight to the face, a good one too. That pretty much is what Tim Zhu's game plan is going to be. That's not me stating that Tim Zhu may not be able to fight good in a multitude of ways. But once again, I'm just, I'm not quite sure if Tim Zhu is going to be that fighter that can fight great in a multitude of ways. Like if you force him to fight on the back foot, I think that he more than likely could probably do it a little bit. But do I think that he could do it as well as some other fighters? No, probably not. But the reason why this fight is very particularly interesting is because Sebastian Fondora <laughs> is not the most technical. I mean, T Tim Zhu, in my view, actually has some decent technical abilities. I just, well, I once again, I have a little bit of questions about overall his foot movement and also a little bit of his head movement. Tim Zhu does not come across to me as a fighter that uses the greatest amount of head movement. Uh, sometimes he can be a little bit stiff, especially with the high guard. That's why he uses the high guard so much. But Sebastian Fondora is a guy to where, when we talk about Sebastian Fondora, that's that's the name definition of what a weight class fighter is or what a weight bully is. Sebastian Fondora is a guy that's what six foot five, six foot six, and sure he's built like a pencil. But at the end of the day, that dude should at least be fighting at one hundred sixty pounds. The fact that they actually allow certain guys like that to fight in those weight divisions, like when they let Jarrett Hurd fight at 154 <laughs> with the size that he was looking like a damn super middleweight at that weight class and Sebastian Fondora fighting at that weight class I mean to me it's a little bit ridiculous I could see Jamel Charlo fighting at that weight class because he's about what 5'11 and you know he probably rehydrates somewhat heavily for the weight class but he's at least a guy to where you could see him fitting there a little bit even though I find him to be more of a middleweight but Fondora there's no <laughs> there's no way in my view that they really should be allowing him to fight there you know, not with that height and reach. It's just ridiculous. And the size of him. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, of course, according to the rules and regulations, they can make the weight. So, you know, of course, we have this fight. But Sebastian Bondora, he pretty much is along that same style of the David Benavidez, Antonio Margarito type of styles. Uh, where basically Sebastian Bondora also kind of likes to plod forward a little bit. And he's going to try to smash you to bits. He's basically going to try to break you down incrementally as well. And he's going to do it with a lot of pressure, very relentless pressure. He'll take three shots to deliver a couple of very good hard shots, you know, or at least one good shot to deliver a few good shots. And Sebastian Fondora is going to be very tough because is Tim Zhu going to have a great body attack in this fight? Now, I think that more than likely he's going to have probably a decent body attack in this fight, especially with uppercuts to the body. But Tim Zhu, at times, in my view, does need to have a little bit of a better body attack, at least when I've seen him in his most recent fights. I thought that he could have had a little bit of a better body attack. So if Tim Zhu is going to be successful in this fight, if he's, if he's going to beat that of Sebastian Fondora, in my view, he needs to start off with a good jab. You know, he needs to watch out for that uppercut, that, that left-hand uppercut that Sebastian Fondora loves to throw. That's pretty much his main favorite punch that he's going to try to beat you with. You know, he needs to really be careful of that. And Costia, excuse me, not Costia, but Tim Zhu. Uh, you know, once again, he's got to be very careful of that. But this is going to be very interesting because, you know, Keith Thurman, in my view, was pretty much going to play into that of Tim Zhu's hands. They were going to be around the same size in terms of height and reach. And I think that Tim Zhu would have been able to eventually wear down Keith Thurman, at least in terms of winning a decision. However, even though Sebastian Fondora was recently stopped by that of Brian Mendoza, Sebastian Fondora, I think, is coming into this fight believing that he truly can win this fight. So Tim Zhu is going to have to be very careful because that leaning back style at times it works, but other times, you know, it can work a little bit against you because Tim Zhu is going to have to show that he can really get inside on the range against Sebastian Fundora, especially over that lead hand. That's going to really be the question. Can he avoid and get under that lead hand to really get inside the range? Because Tim Zhu, even though he doesn't have the worst head movement that I've ever seen, it's not like he's this super duper slick fighter in terms of the head movement. So it's going to be very interesting. Once again, Tim Zhu, a lot like his father, he kind of has that, you know, in the range, rangy style. Basically meaning overall to where I'm inside your range and if you overextend or if you throw at me and if you throw a certain punch, I can get in there at any minute and basically try to counter you, you know. But if you overall are able to push me a little bit, especially successfully, you might be able to give me a little bit of a problem. So once again, we'll see because if Tim Zhu is pushed on the back foot here, I'm not quite sure how successful he's going to be. And Sebastian Fondora, he's probably not the best fighter on the back foot either. But once again, he's a very big guy. He's a guy, once again, that's about, what, six foot six? I don't even know how long his arms are, but it looks about 78 inches at least, you know, when it comes down to it. So once again, that's going to be very interesting. Tim Zhu is going to have to really find a way around that, around that lead hand. He's also going to have to establish a decent body attack. You know, there was a very interesting video that I watched and actually to really compare this fight, 
This is almost like the poor man's version of Canelo Alvarez versus David Benavidez, where one fighter is more technical, you know, and they would probably prefer to pressure. And the other fighter, you know, even though they're not maybe the worst technical that you've ever seen, you know, they're certainly not the best that you've ever seen. And one overall is going to be bigger. And they also more than likely are going to want to pressure. You know, now Canelo and David Benavides, in my view, they're a decent amount better than either of these fighters. But either way, once again, this is almost like the poor man's version of Canelo Alvarez versus David Benavides. Because Sebastian Fondora is going to be a guy to where it's going to be very hard to hit that main target on his face because he's just going to be hard to reach. Now, I think that he's going to have more of a chance than maybe some of the other opponents. But Sebastian Fondora, once again, if Tim Zhu is in this fight, he doesn't want to always try to hit for the face. A lot of the times, certain guys with bigger or taller fighters like that, they always try to go to the head. You have to establish a body attack. And if Tim Zhu, in my view, does not establish a body attack very early on, then he's not going to be as successful as what he wants to be in this fight. Now, he may, he may, you know, even if he just headhunts in this fight, he may be successful you know, because Sebastian Vondora, he he's a little bit hittable. He also does not have the best ahead movement because you can tell that a lot of the times, and he also doesn't have the best defense because you can tell that a lot of his style is very reliant on that height and reach and his size. It just is what it is. So he might be able to be a little bit more successful, especially if he hits Sebastian Vondora, especially if he hits him. But he has to be very careful here. And if we're talking about who has more power, I would think that it's more than likely Tim Zhu, but also to be quite honest with you, I'm not really 100% sure how powerful Tim Zhu is. I think that Tim Zhu more than likely is at least an A-, minus, maybe even an A-grade level puncher. I would at least at the minimum give an A-, minus, but I'm not quite sure because Tim Zhu, in my view, it's not like, you know, and certain people would say, oh, well, he ran through, uh, you know, overall Terrell Gachet and he ran through Tony Harrison and all those guys. But those guys were never really looked at as super duper elite level opponents. Now, you know, Tony Harrison has been hyped up a little bit, especially from the LDBC and new media, because they needed to hype up Jamel Charlo a little bit. But <laughs> Tony Harrison was a guy that was always very chinny. He was a guy that, especially if you showed decent boxing IQ and ability overall to get within his range, that he was always usually going to be stopped. So, you know, it's just going to be very particularly interesting. And to give Tim Zhu a lot of credit, like I stated, he was able to get past Tony Ferguson's lead, excuse me, not Tony Ferguson, but uh, Tony Harrison's lead hand. And he was able to get inside the range. And Tony Harrison is a guy that's also very decently lengthy and a guy that, you know, is pretty quick. But Tony Harrison is also a guy that's also not very defensively responsible. And he's more Tim Zhu's size. I'm going to predict more than likely that Tim Zhu is going to be able to get inside on the range against Sebastian Fundora. But I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be quite as easy as what people think. So Tim Zhu is going to have to establish some decent head movement here. He's going to have to get under that lead hand. Uh, he's going to have to definitely counter early on, watch out for those uppercuts against Sebastian Fondora because that's what Sebastian Fondora is going to be looking to throw. He's going to be looking to stick his lead hand in your face, blind you, you know, overall once again, you know, probably use his feet here and there to move in and out and then run you straight into an uppercut if you run into something. So Tim Zhu does need to be a little bit careful here because this has the high potential to be a war when Tim Zhu may not necessarily want to fight like that against Sebastian Fondora because if you're planning to fight that at Terrence Bud Crawford next, trust me, you want all your full expended energy or you want all your potential energy into that fight because Sebastian Fondora, this is really a dangerous fight because he could really take a lot out of you. This is a guy that once again, he's not going to be hard to hit because he's the most maneuverable or the most technical fighter. But he's a guy that's just so tall to where, once again, if Tim Zhu doesn't establish a great body attack early on, he could find himself potentially even losing the fight. So I hope, at least for Tim Zhu's sake, that more than likely that he starts off with a great body attack, which I predict. You know, I predict because I believe in certain, you know, fights that I've watched at Tim Zhu. You know, he's done certain body attacks, you know, to the body, especially with the uppercut and, you know, little hooks here and there off the of shoulder rolls and, you know, off of counters, you know, kind of waiting, you know, pushing them up against the ropes. But Tim Zhu, once again, there's going to be certain answers, you know, or certain questions answered in this fight potentially, depending on how well Sebastian Fondora fights. Because I want to see how well Tim Zhu gets inside the range against Sebastian Fondora, cuts off the ring against Sebastian Fondora, or what his answer is potentially if Sebastian Fondora starts backing him up. Those are questions that I have about that at Tim Zhu. I wonder because, like I said, I don't find Tim Zhu to be the guy to have the best head movement either. I don't think that, you know, he has the best head movement either. I think that he's definitely better defensively than what Sebastian Fondora is. You know, he definitely keeps his hands up a little bit more. But sometimes that high guard can kind of work against you. So we'll see what happens. 
Could he potentially land, you know, or run into a left hand? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But anyways, now to talk about Sebastian Fundoro, what do I believe that he would have to do to win this fight? I think that he would have to put relentless pressure on that at Tim Zoo, and I think that he would have to back him up pretty much the whole entire time. To be honest with you, I think that for both of these fighters, that is pretty much advisable. Tim Zoo might be able to win this fight in the mid-range, but that's also another question. I don't know if Tim Zoo really wants to keep this fight in the mid-range. Because I don't know really how well Tim Zhu is going to be in the mid-range. If you notice Tim Zhu in pretty much all of his fights, what he pretty much does is that he likes to back you up against the ropes and he likes to break you down. Now, he's a technical guy that likes to break you down. But is he truly great in the middle of the ring? I'm not so quite sure about that. I'm not really quite sure about that. We'll see. And if you're in the ring against a guy that is that much taller than you and that much lengthier than you... You know, if you're going to be in the middle of the ring and try to box this guy, you can try to roll and slip and all that, but you're going to have to use your feet to a certain degree. Like when Canelo Alvarez, like a lot of people, of course, love to criticize his feet, and to a degree that's understandable because Canelo does not always have the best of feet. But one thing about Canelo that I'll say is this, even though at times he can be a bit flat-footed and he doesn't always have the quickest of feet, at least, you know, sometimes. But Canelo Alvarez, one thing I always state about him is that not only is he excellent defensively and a guy that can slip and roll and has excellent head movement and excellent counterpunching ability, but on top of that, he will use his feet at least at certain times to move in and outside of the range. I've seen it against Golovkin. I've seen it against Danny Jacobs. I've seen it against some other fighters. So if Canelo needs to back up and then move in and outside of the range, at times he will. Will Tim Zhu be able to do that? We'll see. I hope for his sake that he does. But as for Sebastian Fondura, once again, you know, I think that you use that lead hand, you know, double up the jab, you know, stick that lead hand in his face. Keep Tim Zhu pretty much either in the middle of the ring where you can outreach him, you know, overall. Don't be afraid to double jab and throw that left cross down the pipe because if there's anything possibly that Tim Zhu might be more vulnerable to, I'm not quite sure if it's going to be completely an uppercut. Now, I am going to be interested to see how Tim Zhu reacts to a body attack because Tim Zhu kind of does have that high guard style, and he seems to defend to the head very well. But I haven't really seen anyone overall go to the body, because when you have a high guard, sometimes your body can be a little bit open. I've seen it in multiple fights, so you know, especially to a lead hand. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Tim Zhu might potentially be a little bit more open to a body attack, so let's see what happens. I'm going to be very interested to see how he reacts to that. But Sebastian Fondora is going to have to try to keep this fight, in my view, in the mid of the range. Use your feet. Don't be afraid to use your feet to get in outside of the range, at least at times. But try to keep this fight either in the mid range or try to bully him up against the ropes and keep him in the corner and keep him up against the ropes. Try to hurt this man early. You know, they might have somewhat of similar game plans because this the fight is pretty much going to go to whoever really has the better power in this fight, in my view, and also over who's, whoever is going to hurt the other person more. Now, I assume that Tim Zhu more than likely is going to win the fight because I do believe that he's the more technical fighter. But like I said, do I believe that Tim Zhu is just this boxing wizard in terms of boxing IQ? I think that he's a very decent fighter. But would I say that he's an A-plus fighter? Would I say he's on my top 10 pound for pound list? No, personally, I wouldn't say that. Tim Zhu, in my view, is about around the class of an A-minus fighter. I don't know if I can really put him any higher than that, you know, because I, I wouldn't put him within that same league of Errol Spence. I wouldn't put him in that same league of Jamel Charlo, at least overall at his best. You know, may maybe Jamel Charlo, maybe, you know, maybe. But to be but to be quite honest with you, I always thought that Jamel Charlo was about an A minus fighter anyway. You know, so it is what it is. Maybe A at the highest, you know, but you know, it's whatever. But Tim Zhu, once again, I'm gonna be very interested to see how he reacts to some of those questions that I pose. That's gonna be very interesting. And Fondoro, once again, if he's gonna win this fight. You know, he's going to have to have his hands up a little bit more, especially in certain exchanges. But you really don't want this fight, you know, getting there in the first place. So try to blind Tim Zhu, in my view, with that lead hand. And, you know, try to <laughs> try to overall, once again, keep this fight in the mid-range. And if Tim Zhu tries to get in on inside on the range, you know, use your lead hand. You're a dude that's going to be much lengthier than him. You know, you can overall probably throw certain uppercuts to the body, you know, or throw that left hand down the pipe. Don't be afraid overall to throw the left cross. That's not a punch that I see Sebastian Fondor throw a whole lot. He's mainly a guy that likes to barrage you with a bunch of hooks and uppercuts, and that might be his downfall. He's a guy that once again he's he's pretty much a spammer. So we'll we'll see what he ends up at, what he ends up doing in the fight. But as for the fight prediction, I believe that Costia Zoo, excuse me, not not Costia, my bad. But Tim Zoo, I believe that uh, I believe that more than likely he's going to beat that as Sebastian Fondora. I'm going to predict 
either a stoppage at around the ninth or 10th round of the fight. Uh, of course, by that, a knockout uh, or at least TKO or uh, a unanimous decision or majority decision for that at Timzu. I wouldn't really be surprised with any of those results. If Sebastian Fundora ended up winning the fight, I wouldn't be shocked. I'm giving him about a 30% chance to win this fight. I just don't know if I would put him any higher than that, especially in his, because in his most recent fight, he ended up getting knocked out you know, by a guy that pretty much was looked at as a journeyman. So we'll see what happens in that fight. But as for now, I have Tim Zhu, uh, in my view, uh, winning that fight. I just believe that he's better defensively. I think he's the better technical fighter. I assume that he's going to be intelligent enough and that his corner is going to be intelligent enough to go to the body very early on and not just headhunt again that uh, against that of Sebastian Fondora. And I think that debatably that Tim Zhu also has more power in his hands. So it'll be very interesting. I believe that Tim Zhu more than likely is going to get the victory. Uh, you know, so we'll see. We'll see. But that's what I believe Tim Zhu is going to have to do. And I think that Tim Zhu more than likely will win the fight, either by ladder round stoppage. But once again, I will state this. I don't know if I'm predicting Tim Zhu to be completely dominant in this fight. If he was very dominant in this fight, it would definitely impress me because Sebastian Fondura is going to be a guy to where unless he gets knocked out very early or you just hurt him with every single punch that you throw, um, or he just has that good of counterpunching placement where he's just really not missing, which to be quite honest with you, I've never really seen from Tim Zhu, even though he's a very good counterpuncher. You know, that would impress me. That would really impress me. So we'll see what happens. But moving on to the co-main event between that of Orlando Romero uh, versus Isaac Pitbull Cruz. That, of course, is also for a belt, uh, I believe, at the 140-pound weight class. Of course, two of <laughs> two former opponents, uh, Mr. Javante Tang Davis, who is one of the faces of boxing, um, you know, and I think that this is excellent matchmaking because, of course, now that Willie Romero is the champion, if Isaac Pitbull Cruz is now champion, you can now overall, you know, pretty much allege, well, Javante Tang Davis, who is pretty much our face of the PBC, you know, uh, he, you know, you guys, you know, kind of claimed that he wasn't facing the best of opponents. And now look, those guys are champions. Um, now, my view, <laughs> would they have ever became champions at the 140 pound weight class had those belts not been relinquished by Josh Taylor? Probably not, but it is what it is. You know, certain fighters become champions off of that. Like I stated, those are fighters that maybe they could become champions if there's ever a weaker weight class and the belts are relinquished or, you know, there, there's a weaker champion there. But those guys, in my view, are not real championship caliber fighters, you know. But the question is, once again, is that who is potentially going to win this fight? You know, and this is a very interesting fight because, <laughs> to be quite honest with you, just in my personal view... I don't find either of these fighters really to be elite fighters. There's certain things that they do that, of course, can make them very dangerous. Isaac Pitbull Cruz is a guy that always keeps his hands up. He's very aggressive. He appears to have great stamina and a great gas tank. But he's also a guy that, in my view, is a relatively one-dimensional fighter. He's a guy that leads with a lot of hooks, and you kind of know his plan of attack. But he's going to be very hard to fight against because he's pretty much the little engine that could. You know, the, the, the guy that is going to come forward. And sure, he's a little bit shorter. He's a little bit stouter. But he's also a guy that has a decent amount of pop in his punches. He's always going to, you know, somewhat be defensively responsible. Even though, of course, he leads with a lot of his hooks. And, you know, his attacks are fairly one-dimensional. And I also don't think that he, you know, steps in with a jab a whole lot. Like, people compare him to Mike Tyson a lot. And in a way, I guess you can say that. But Isaac Pitbull Cruz, you know, and both of these fighters really were hyped up mainly by that in new media and the LDBC because they needed to try to make Javante Tank Davis's resume look better than what, than what it actually is. Uh, these guys are not elite caliber fighters. It is what it is, <laughs> right? They're just they're just not elite caliber fighters. Like the LDBC and new media, they like to talk about other fighters. For example, you know, like on Canelo's resume about him fighting these you know, weak European white boys and all sort of stuff. Well, say whatever you want to, but Callum Smith at the end of the day was a legitimate, at least probably on the level of an A minus level champion. You know, Caleb Plant and Billy Joe Saunders definitely were decent champions at the time when Canelo fought them and two of the best fighters around those weight divisions, you know, who would have gave even some of the tougher fighters a great run for their money as Caleb Plant proved against that of David Benavidez. But anyways, you know, when it comes down to it, Rolly Romero and Isaac Pitbull Cruz, those guys are not really guys that are great fighters. You know, it just is what it is. Rolly Romero is a guy that is very awkward. He doesn't really have the best defeat. It appeared that in his last fight that he tried to be a little bit more technical. And in terms of certain technical things, he looked a little bit better. But Rolly Romero is just never going to be a guy that's going to be an elite A-grade level boxer. He's never going to be that guy. What makes Rolly Romero dangerous is that he has enough boxing technique 
overall to kind of get by. And on top of that, he has great athleticism. He has great punching power. And if you let him tee off on you, then, you know, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because he can hit, <laughs> you know. He's a guy that, once again, is probably about a natural 140 or 135 pounder. And he's a guy that punches very hard, you know. And he has he seems to have a decent amount of confidence within himself. So he's always a dangerous fighter. But in my view, he doesn't really work off the jab very well. He has terrible feet, <laughs> in my personal view. He doesn't have great defense, even though he's tried to improve it, clearly ever since the Javante Tank Davis loss. You know, I think that, uh, you know, he's improved a little bit, but... Rolly Romero is a brawler. He's he's a guy that at times tries to be a little bit technical, but this dude pretty much is a windmill thrower, just like that of Deontay Wilder. This guy, you know, and at least with Deontay Wilder, he was in a division to where he can kind of get away with it because he has the size and the power for it. Rolly Romero is a guy to where he's in a weight class to where those guys move quicker and, and those guys, you know, they're usually, you know, allowed to be a little bit more technical because of their size, you know, and the reputable weight class. You know, and the reputation of that weight class, I should say, excuse me. So, Rolly Romero, if he's going to win this fight, I think that he, of course, is really going to have to work behind the jab. And he's going to have to not be afraid to throw certain punches, especially if Isaac Pitbull Cruz gets on the inside against him. And what I noticed about Rolly Romero, especially in his last fight, that once someone kind of gets on the inside range of them, he gets a little bit uncomfortable. And he's a guy because he's not really great, <laughs> you know, on the ropes and he's not super great on the inside. He is a guy that prefers to have you within the mid-range or, you know, he prefers to actually fight from a distance. You know, he's not super great on the inside from what I've seen. He gets a little bit uncomfortable. And that's why it's going to be very particularly interesting because Isaac Pitbull Cruz doesn't like to fight anywhere else but on the inside. <laughs> and so that's why if I were going to make a prediction, I probably would have to predict that of Isaac Pitbull Cruz to win this fight because I think that Isaac Pitbull Cruz, that, you know, he's probably going to be the better technical fighter. Uh, even though I think that Isaac Pitbull Cruz, I think that once again, he's also a relatively one-dimensional fighter like Rolly Romero. Uh, and I don't think that he's an elite fighter. I think that he definitely has the better defensive responsibility. I think that he's going to give Rolly a lot of trouble on the inside. And I think that he has enough power to give Rolly Romero trouble. Now, I could see Rolly Romero winning this fight. This is a fight that, in my view, could go either way. It's a 60-40 fight. But I would give the advantage to Isaac Pitbull Cruz because of his activity. And that's also another one of the things that I have to take a look at. Once again, Isaac Pitbull Cruz, has a, he has a great gas tank. And how I know that he has a great gas tank is because this guy is always trying to take someone's head off every single round. He's always coming straight for you. All right, he's like a bull overall in the Matador contest. He's going he's gonna to be coming straight for you the whole entire time. And whether he misses you the first or couple times, it doesn't matter to him. He's going to be coming forward. So once again, Isaac Pitbull Cruz, in my view... Uh, he always has his hands up. I think that he has debatably a better gas tank, even though I haven't seen Rolly's, you know, gas tank really exposed or anything like that. But he's like Pitbull Cruz is going to put a lot of pressure on Rolly. And I don't know if Rolly has the head movement, nor the feet, nor the boxing IQ to really defend against that super consistently. And he's like Pitbull Cruz once again. He doesn't work around the jab very well, but Rolly Romero also doesn't have the best of feet. You know, and he kind of tries to line you up somewhat within that of the mid range. He's not a guy that always uses his feet to the best of his ability either. So we'll see, you know, what ends up happening here. But I believe that Isaac Pitbull Cruz, that he's either going to win by that of a ladder round stoppage against Rolly Romero. But I'm going to state overall that more than likely he wins by that a decision. That's what I'll state. I believe that Isaac Pitbull Cruz, that more than likely he's going to win by that a decision. I believe that he's going to be more active than Rolly Romero. I think Rolly Romero has always had a difficulty being a little bit more active against fighters. Uh, you know, now, of course, he was kind of winning, in my view, against Javante Tank Davis. But A, I think that Javante really was kind of playing with him to a certain degree. And B, you know, Javante, you know, even if he wasn't playing with him, Javante in some of his most recent fights has had a little bit of a problem not being the most active. But because he has, you know, that level of technique and punching power, he can kind of get away with that to a certain degree. And on top of that, these fighters that he's fighting right now are not really, in my view, legitimate A-grade level fighters. It just is what it is. Uh, so we'll see who ends up winning these fights. But my prediction is Tim Zhu, probably by that of a ladder round stoppage within that of the 10th round or by that a unanimous decision. Really wouldn't be surprised if it was by unanimous decision. And then, of course, Isaac Pitbull Cruz versus that of Rolando Romero. I'm going to predict more than likely Isaac Pitbull Cruz by unanimous decision. But we'll see what ends up happening here. It should be very particularly interesting. But that pretty much is about it for today. Those are my two fight predictions. Of course, there are other fights on this card. Arasani Lara, of course, is defending, I believe, his WBA middleweight title uh, at the middleweight class. Lara, of course, uh, once upon a time, 
in my view, one of the best fighters on the planet. A guy that was always very underrated. Unfortunately, his career didn't turn out probably as great uh, overall as potentially what it could have. But Lara, of course, is still a very decent fighter. Of course, he's still very technical. But Lara is just a guy to where you could tell even a couple of years ago or even, even more than that. Lara's legs have just really not been quite the same as what they were. Now, he's going to win this fight because... I don't think this is a Rafa guy, at least from what I've seen of him. He just doesn't appear to be that high grade of an opponent. But, you know, it's going to be it's going to be very particularly interesting. We'll see. Lara's always a great watch, at least for me, uh, especially when he actually goes in for the kill. Because Lara actually has decent punching power when he wants to use it. But we'll see what happens. But anyways, that's pretty much about it for today. I just thought that I would give my little fight preview and my fight analysis on both of those fights. This is going to be a very interesting card. Uh, once again, I don't think that it's the best card. Uh, available but it's definitely interesting and of course Crawford could fight the potential winner of either one of these fighters it's going to be very interesting so we'll see what happens but anyways that's pretty much about it for today thank you all so much for watching I'll talk to y'all later